Well, well, let's start there. I mean, how, when you set up Naked Wines, how did you, how did you look at making that company different? So we set up in 2008, which was the last crisis before the current crisis. Uh, and so it was a weird time, but it also meant that everybody had, w was willing to look at new ideas. And the, the whole thought behind Naked was that uh, wine costs too much money because winemakers need to spend so much selling it. And if uh, we could get customers to buy the wine before it was made, then the winemakers would need to waste the money selling it, which means the customers would get good wine for better money, uh, which means that uh, you wouldn't need to sell hard to them, which means you'd, need, you'd keep them for years, which meant you would have a good business, right? So that was the original thought. And the thing about 2008 was winemakers needed money desperately because the banks weren't lending. Uh, we didn't have enough money to fund them. So the only place that could come from would be our customers. And so, we, you know, it was partly inspiration, but partly also just desperation that forced us into that. And what we discovered, much to our surprise, was when we did to people, you know, here's a really good bottle of wine and you can have it tomorrow, uh, whatever level of response that generated, we'd get like four X that, where we said to people, here's a winemaker who's run into problems. Uh, and you can't taste the wine, but if you pay today, we can let you have it in a year's time. And people are much more engaged in that than they were in a simple transaction to buy wine. Um, and so that kind of, although we didn't quite understand it at the time, turned into what we call a virtuous circle, where we wanted to build a company where our winemakers, uh, in other words, our suppliers, our founders, our staff, we're all in it together. And we weren't trying to exploit one group of people to the benefit of another, but that by everybody sharing in uh, the benefit of the company, everyone would benefit. And with staff, you do that by making them into shareholders. Uh, with shareholders, you do that because they're really shareholders. And so the new thing was to bring the winemakers in uh, and make them part of the deal as well. And and. Eventually, we you know, took a few years to find exactly the right shape of the business, but building it eventually into a business where the customers funded wines in advance and winemakers could leave their day job and sit up and just focus on making wine. Mm -hmm. That's what made it different. And, and after a lot, a lot of other benefits came as well, like, no, you don't need to hard sell because people have already bought. Uh, and then, you know, it changes your marketing approach, it changes the way you talk to the customers, your investors and everything else. Mm. Everyone, uh, your video is cutting out. Are you next to the router or what's the, can you see me well? Because I think you, you keep. I can, I can see you perfectly. I mean, we are in a shared router in a marina. Right, right. Okay. Well, that's fine. So, I mean, maybe just put the screen up or just sit down maybe slightly so I can see you. I can't really see you at the moment. Is, this... is that the light? Yeah, that's better. I mean, maybe you want to set yourself up somewhere where you can. All right. Um, that works. Is, is that comfortable or not? Let me see if I can put the iPad on the front here without dropping it in the water. <laughs> yeah. Where's the camera? <laughs> That's pretty precarious. Try to get this <laughs> little up a bit, yeah. That's it. Uh, Is that right or not? It's not going to stay there very easily. Uh, would it be better if I if I got a laptop? That'll be. Um, I mean, whatever com whatever's comfortable. For you. I tell you what I can do. I can go and sit on shore uh, under a canopy. That may be easier. Let me let me try. It. Just take me two seconds. That's right. I mean, take your time. I'm in mean, no rush. Well, it's your Easter. I mean, they're all, they're all rolling into one lately, right? <laughs> with this, with this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I've I haven't left the house in a month, so <laughs> losing track of days. 
and it's your. No, no, it's good. I'll go and sit over here. When is your lockdown supposed to finish? So, I mean, I have no no idea. I think that well, Boris is Boris is in, in intensive care, so um, yeah. Hopefully, he's he's going to pull through. But then, yeah, I think it, hopefully it should ease up in a in a couple of weeks. But I mean, I can't imagine stuff's going to get back to normal in, in any time soon. Um, so, overall, it's been pretty good news for us, but um, I guess also quite good news for Naked as well. I saw the update the other day, which was great. Uh, yeah. Market seems market like that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting how it does take the coronavirus to alert people to some things. Eh? And I, I think there is a change in behavior. I think so. Yeah. I mean, we, we've yeah. literally had, um, even over the last week, we've we've gave, given access to schools and we've had 550 users from business schools and professors and students in the last week, which has been great news for us. But um, Fantastic. Um, now it's just about getting getting a plan together um so is is that better can you see better that's much better yeah much better um so so tell me about the clearly you've you've thought about a new way to to kind of build a business with customers at the forefront that actually become the shareholders and and finance the business in a way what about the culture that you look to build in naked well the interesting thing is we never really thought about the culture the first time i thought about culture was when Naked was acquired by Majestic Wines, and all of a sudden, I was stepping into a, a job I, I'd never had a job before. I'd always started the companies I worked for, and so when you start the company, you never think about the culture because you start with nothing. Mm. Um, so you know, when we were setting up Naked, to be honest, I think the way the culture was formed was a function of first of all, it was two thousand and eight was when we started, so it was quite a weird time. And there was a real feeling of, um, you know, we, we, we've, we were on our own here. There's no, no one's going to help us. The second thing was the, um, uh, uh, one of our competitors tried quite hard to get us closed down and uh, like called our suppliers and said, you know, don't deal with these guys. They're going bankrupt and that kind of thing. Mm. And so it led to a bit of an, us against them, us against the world. And so we land up with a very tight group of people. And I, I read that Jose Mourinho's, one of his techniques was always us against the rest of the world and everyone hates us. And, mm. uh, you know, and in a way that happened for us. And then, of course, we, we're a bit anti wine establishment. So a lot of the wine critics were um, scathing, <laughs> I think the mm. kindest word to say. Uh, so it did build up this really strong feeling of we're, we're trying to do something right here. Uh, lots of people don't want us to succeed. And for that reason, fuck them. Mm. We are going to, you know, that just kind of spurred us on. And what I think that led to was a really collective sense responsibility, which was aided by the fact that everybody left good jobs to go to start it naked. And everyone was a shareholder. So, you know, everyone had burnt their bridges. And if we succeeded, everyone was going to benefit from that. Mm. And if we failed, then we were all in the ship together. Um, so I think that does just, without doing anything else, does create a really strong culture. I think a lot of startups benefit from that. I think the hard thing is when you then go from one office to an international operation. And, you know, Naked Wines is based in Norwich. It's quite a small town. A lot of people socialize together. And all of a sudden, when we had an American business and Australian business, I think that one of the most surprising things to me was how similar the culture is. Mm. And in fact, I, the Australian business was six months old the first time I set foot in, in the door. And the, the weird thing was, it was just instantly identifiable as, as a naked culture. And I think the key there was we always tried to move enough people into a new business so that there was like you know if you're making sourdough bread there was a really good starter Mm. and there were enough people to get the culture moving and 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 once it does it is an attractive culture 
you know, it's a very meritocratic. So there are a lot of young people who have um, not come from a, you know, a glamorous track record, uh, unemployed French horn players, unemployed actors, uh, <laughs> but, you know, very talented people who've gone on to do great things at Naked. So I think very meritocratic. Secondly, we've got a very strong culture of testing, which means that a lot of the things which eventually land up working, actually, uh, a lot of the ideas originate out of somewhere else in the organization. It's not a case of a higher salary wins. Uh, and it is an organization that, you know, and, and because the organization is built around trying to build a better sort of company, I think the, the fact that people feel like we're trying to do something good uh, really helps as well. And I mean, there are, there are a couple of things which are, I think, um, emblematic of that. One of them was we had the big wildfires in California. Um, we said, look, it's completely inappropriate to be trying to sell wine to customers while there are fires burning around us. And so instead we did an appeal to customers and said, look, the people are going to need money. We don't know who, or we don't know how much, but uh, there are going to be some people who are going to be in a real pickle after this fire. Uh, please help out. And uh, we raised about $800,000 on the back of that. And, you know, by contrast, I think Facebook raised half a million dollars and, and Google raised a million dollars. Mm. And Tiny Little Naked Wines raised $800,000. And I think that's just a, um, that just shows that our culture extends beyond the people who work for the company into the customers themselves. And I think when your customers and your people feel the same way about the company, actually the culture tends to survive. I think where you see culture fail is where what happens inside a company and what it looks like outside the company are two different things. And eventually it becomes obvious that one of them is a fraud. Hmm. Um how do you as a leader think about this testing culture and why do you think most leaders find it so hard to follow such a similar test and learn? So, I mean, very early on, we developed a don't debate test and it's one of our key founding principles. And the reason we did that was we, uh, you know, as the organization grew and we brought people in, uh, especially marketing people, what we found is they would place a lot of emotional store on trying to be right. And like trying to be a water diviner, you know, I think the answer is over there. And we kept going, well, we don't care what you think. And we don't care what I think either. We just want to know where the water is. And if you're right or wrong, it's, it's, no. what we really care about is, are you going to do a really good job of finding the water? And once you found it, are we going to be certain that's all the water? And um, so what had started as being something which was just instinctive, as the organization grew and we brought more people in from the outside, we realized we needed to codify it. And so what that boiled down to was three things. First of all, uh, anybody who's got any idea, uh, we're not interested in the idea, unless you can turn it into a test. So, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of companies who ask people for ideas, and ideas are cheap. But if you prepare, if you really believe in your idea, you have to be prepared to put the energy into figuring out how we're going to prototype this. Um, so we want ideas, but only if you prepare to show that you believe in it enough that you can develop it into a prototype. The second thing was, um, we found a way of just finding, finding, answering questions really quickly. So a, a lot of people would build big complex supply chains around potential new business ideas. And everyone gets really absorbed in the minutia of building a new business. This is fun, it's exciting, without really knowing if there was ever you know, any legs in it. And so we developed something called, we call painted door testing which was if you want to know if an idea for a new nightclub is going to work, don't open a nightclub. Just find a wall, paint the door on it. And if you see lots of people trying to open the door, mm -hmm. you know it's a great idea. Then build the nightclub. But 
you know, if everyone just walks by, don't, don't bother building the latter, you're just wasting your time. And, and the third thing is, is um, you know, we, we, we don't care if you can guess right. We only care that you're thorough. And we, we kind of use the example of like an oil prospector. You know, oil prospectors don't pay people to go, I think it's over there, I think it's over there. They pay people to map out the landscape and do survey testing and drill lots of cheap holes. And so that, number one, if there is oil, you're going to find it. Number two, once you've found the oil, that's all the oil. There isn't another pot of oil somewhere. And in a way, the best thing about testing is celebrating negative results. Because it just means, right, we can stop talking about that. We can stop diverting our attention. We can stop challenging ourselves and questioning ourselves. We've tested it. We know our customers don't want that. Don't waste another second thinking about it. So I think, you know, it's like the data wins and the data is all we care about is important. But the key corollary to that is you celebrate negative test results as much as you celebrate positive ones because they are just about as important. Right. And so take me back to the early days of Naked then and, and, and your marketing strategy for those early adopters. Well, because we had absolutely no comparable business model and we had absolutely no idea how to explain to people how a model worked, uh, we just started by offering people free wine and thought that was the best way to get a sort of critical mass of people on the site and trying it. And so we just ran Facebook, Facebook ads saying uh, free wine. And, and all you had to do was we said, look, we'll send you a case of wine and all we ask you to do is review them. And um, we got 100 customers. And when I last looked, something like 55 of those people, 11 years on, are still customers. Mm. And so amazingly, while offering free wine, people didn't take the piss they actually did come along and did review the wines and then they met the wine makers and got into the whole thing the next batch of people along uh we we just thought right we just need to make this an absolute no-brainer deal so we started wallpapering britain with vouchers and you know the fact is it has just been so successful <laughs> bringing customers in it still remains a significant part of our business and uh you know, I, uh, we, for as long as I can remember, people have been saying, oh, I think vouchers have stopped working. They've, they've never stopped working. They, they remain a very important way of bringing people in. Well, to talk to me about your strategy around vouchers, because, I, you know, we, I think everyone's seen them, everyone gets them in some kind of way. And, and talk to me about how you approached it. Well, it's as simple as, you know, we, we, we gave the first one away for free. And we thought we needed to make the second tranche an absolute no-brainer offer. Uh, but it turns out that running a no-brainer offer is still the most efficient way of recruiting new customers. Um, and I think, you know, I think the evolution of it since then has been the impact of social media recruitment. So where a big learning there for us was uh, we had three or four attempts at, at trying to advertise on Facebook and all of them failed dismally. And they failed dismally because we were just copying what everyone else was doing. We, we didn't have in-house expertise. We didn't think about it in a new way. And so our ads were just saying, you know, cheap wine, cheap white wine, cheap red wine, just mm -hmm. the same as everyone else's. Uh, we brought in a guy called Prince Nelson who just rethought the whole thing for us. And what he found out was a few things. The first is, show don't tell so don't tell customers we've got the right thing for you ask customers what they want and then go oh well if you like those things then we're right for you but if you like these things we're not right for you um and and the, the second thing was giving people useful information and the and you know instead of trying to sell to them if you help people figure out you know five common dinner party mistakes people make with wine for example people are fascinated by that mm -hmm. uh, and then the kind of people you have to sell hard to don't tend to be good customers the kind of people that go well that's really interesting yeah i'd like to become a customer tend to be good customers so what we found is that not selling is the best sales technique 
and every time we're trying to do a hard sell, in fact, it doesn't really work. You bring in more people, but you get low LTVs. So actually the economics are worse. So the model has evolved quite significantly. Uh, and what we find when we survey customers is very often when we say to them, so how do you hear about Naked? It'll be oh, a friend of mine's a customer of yours. And they me a few times about it. And then I saw an ad you ran on Facebook and I thought that was quite interesting. And then a voucher turned up. So it really is a mix now. Mm. And my guess is vouchers wouldn't work nearly as well on their own the way they did at the beginning. But because we've got the mix right, uh, it remains an important piece of the business. Mm. And so the vouchers, it's really just it, it, the free ones. You know, the first one is free. Second one is X amount. And you plan to have that customer for 10, five to 10 years or however long you want the lifetime to be. Yeah. And yeah. You know, one of the questions people often ask is, are LTVs reliable? Do they actually turn out like that? And the answer is, if you set it up right and you measure right, absolutely. Uh, they are highly, highly predictable. And um, we, we, you know, five or six years ago, we brought in some small people who took our very basic understanding of LTVs and made it much more sophisticated. Uh, one of whom is a guy called Nick Devlin, who's running Naked Wines today. Mm. Um, and instead of just measuring LTV, they started measuring LTV of different customer groups, different recruitment channels, what people did on the site, and then different early behaviors. So whereas before we would have to wait a few years to find out a customer's true lifetime value, now within six weeks, we can predict a customer's true lifetime value to within about 15%, just based on a few simple actions that they take. And what that means is your cycle time for learning is much faster because within six weeks, you're able to measure an ROI on an advert, not just by number of customers or surviving customers or anything else, but LTV divided by cost, which is the ultimate measure. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about, I want to get into detail on LTV in a moment, but just back to this communication with customers. It's interesting how you say those, and clearly people want to be communicated with or messaged to differently, but it's those, you don't want to sell hard to people who are going to churn after a year or two years. You want to get those people that you actually, and you're saying you actually give them information or something interesting and then piques their interest in what you're offering over here. So it's slightly exactly. different. Yeah, so, you know, like I say, the key thing we found out was the best way to sell is not selling. So if we sent an email to customers going, incredible deal, only 300 cases, get them quick, you know, you get a certain level of response. If you send an email to customers going, hey, we found this wine maker, and his name's Will, and he's trying to set up this new winery, and he has his idea, and he's run into a few problems, and we think of helping him out and is the kind of wines he's want to make. Shall we back him, yes or no? You get far more people participating. And then when you go back to those people and go, all right, look, we back Will, uh, and now he's got this wine, and you know, we could either for seven pounds have this really nice bottle of wine, or for 10 pounds he can age it in oak for a year, use only the best fruit, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And you can all for fifteen pounds. This is the kind, and, and mm. you know, vote. Tell us what you want us to make. Which means by the time the wine turns up, you don't need to sell it because people have already bought into backing the person. They bought into the wine. Sometimes the label design, that kind of thing. And so what it means is that uh, our marketing can be much more like a consultation than a sales pitch. Uh, and then customers are bought into the end result and then you don't need to persuade them and you know you asked about culture earlier that's very similar on the culture if you just march out and tell your staff right this is it we're going up that hill yeah uh, you're not going to get nearly as good a re response as if you go guys here are our choices we could go up that hill or we could go up that hill and here are the pros and cons so we're going to have mm -hmm. to think about this um so it's 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 you know it's not very different leading other group of people. Basically. But the interesting point I find about Naked is that it, it taps into that emotional or psychological side of the customer. And you know, they're, not, they're not necessarily just buying wine. They're buying, yeah. they're funding someone's opportunity. And, and, and I think also you played on that, or clearly you realized that early on by calling them yeah. angels. Yeah. Which, 
Yeah, which is a, a, a term that you know now now comes from the private equity world, but before I came from the theatre world. Look, uh, the other thing, frankly, is you know a bit like sex. No one has yet developed the words that describe the taste of a bottle of wine properly, and the words the wine industry use are just utterly hopeless. Nobody knows what the hell that means. Uh, whereas when you tell someone's life story, everyone can get that, and so. Um, we just found it much easier to sell the person than to sell the bottle. Um, the second thing is, if because we are selling the wine before it's made, one of the interesting things about wine is if you put you know another 50p worth of wine in the bottle, you get another five pounds worth of taste. So one of the nice things about wine is the relationship between what it actually costs to make and the price people are prepared to pay is 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 it's quite extreme so if you buy a five pound bottle of wine in britain i think it's only 30p a wine and then if you buy a 10 pound bottle of wine you're getting about eight times as much wine um and so we're backing customers we're backing winemakers before the wine is even made if you get customers bought into the opportunity to make the wine the best it can be you can then say to the winemaker right go ahead use proper oak barrels pick only the best fruit use the best techniques, take, take your time to make this as good as it can be. And then you land up with a better wine. So there is an element of, uh, by bringing people in early, you produce a better product for the money, which means the customers are happier, which means they stick around longer. So you keep the virtuous circle going. If you are in the position that virtually all of our competitors are, which is someone's made some wine, now you've got to go and sell it. Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 you've missed out on so much of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And what's your view about, as a startup, taking that view vocally or publicly against the establishment and being vocal about it, and really using that as a market employ to say, kind of, you know fuck you, kind of, the establishment. And, and, and I think I've seen various different, Mark yeah. Benioff done it at Salesforce, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, how do you, yeah. do you actively think about that? Or how do you really think about that, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I worked for Richard Branson for 13 years. So I've learned, I've learned a few things from him. But one of them is find industries that have done a very poor job of communicating with customers and looking after customers' interests and then it's much easier to succeed in those industries. So, you know, before wine, I was in financial services, and we said virgin money. And if few businesses have done a worse job of looking after customers than banks. Uh, the thing with wine is, for some bizarre reason, the wine industry loves talking down to customers and talking to them in a language they don't understand, and actually the wine industry, most of the wine industry don't understand it either. Mm. Um, and so, Part of the thing, what attracted me to wine was the number of people wearing emperor's new clothes and customers feeling like, I hate being talked to like I'm stupid. And, and you know, it's really bizarre. People who, who spend tens of thousands on a car and hundreds of thousands on a house and thousands of pounds on a holiday, if you give them the wine list in a restaurant and they have to make a decision about tens of pounds in the wine, go, you know, well, someone else... <laughs> People feel really uncomfortable about force, being forced into make wine choices. And so it was, I think, easy for us to take a position that the rest of the wine industry is talking crap. Mm. And we're going to point out that the emperor's not wearing any clothes. Uh, and this is to your benefit. Of course, the emperor didn't like that. And uh, a lot of the wine critics got very snarky about it. But the fact is, you know, there are an awful lot of bottles of wine that cost 50 pounds and up, which should cost 15 pounds. And the wine industry is falling over themselves to say how this is an amazing bottle of wine. It is, but it could be an amazing 15 pound bottle of wine. And uh, there's, there's no reason why wine should cost as much as it does. Right. But you have to have, like you said, you have to have the sum of your business and the value that you're generating to really offer, to really go against the establishment yes. incredibly, you know? Um, so yes, exactly. Yeah. It has to be authentic to be able to do that. And moving on to look at, I guess, 
you know, with lifetime value and it links to vouchers and promotions and marketing. How did you, how do you think about lifetime value more broadly? Well, first of all, the founding philosophy of the business was we wanted to build this virtuous circle where uh, the relationship between what it costs to acquire a customer and what the customer's worth was more than four. And uh, what that meant was we were not having to spend a lot of money on marketing, which meant we didn't need to overcharge our customers for wines to fund that marketing, which meant that customers would stick around. So, virtuous circle. And so, to do the corollary of that is we had to have customers who were going to stick around for a long time. So, we built the business from the beginning on the assumption that there would be high LCD customers. And then we set off to acquire them. And in doing that, we had to figure out how we made them into high LTV customers. And part of it's how you acquire them, but part of it's how you treat them afterwards. And we've talked a bit about the acquisition side and how using hard sell brings in big numbers of customers, but not good LTV. The same thing applies to ongoing customer relationship management. And one of the first things we found was um, we had to bribe our call center staff to refund customers. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, if, if we have an unconditional money back guarantee, but if someone in the call center felt that customers were taking the piss, they, they'd start being protective of the company's interests and start trying to like, mm, you know, I don't think we should be refunding you here. Mm -hmm. And so we eventually turned that around in a few ways. Uh, one of them was we, we, we stopped measuring by call center agent how, what refunds you're giving or how long it, it took to do a call or how many calls per hour or any of stuff. We only measure five-star feedback. Uh, but the second thing was we started saying to people, look, it's not a case of minimizing the refunds to customers. It's a case of maximizing customer LTV. Mm. And if you can spend five pounds to add 50 pounds to a customer's lifetime, that's a really good deal. So think about this as an investment, not an expense. And, um, and we set up something which we call giraffing. And it came from an idea that came from Airbnb where there was a story in Airbnb where a customer had left the home uh, locked up their kid's baby giraffe in the house and they phoned and spoke to a call center agent who took it upon themselves to go around the house, get in, get the giraffe, drive to the airport and get it back to the family before they even got on the plane. And so we used that as a story inside the company and said, look, you know, that expense has made that person into an Airbnb customer for life. Yeah. And so don't think of it as an expense. Think about it as an investment and how can you do the same thing? And there have been some absolutely fantastic examples of people going out of their way to help a customer. Uh, and it's, it's come back to us multiple times, not just because customers' lifetimes reflect that, but because they tell everybody. <laughs> and uh, you know, very often people will say to us, I became a customer because my friend told me he once had a bad delivery and this is how he resolved it, that kind of thing. Mm. But that also helps when you've got the, the cash flow there from the angels as well to do that, right? To begin with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which comes back to good business design in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, how did you think about the promotion vouchers and promotional activity more broadly and brand equity and your brand? Because the textbooks would say, the more you promote, the more you advertise it is going to reduce your brand equity. But how do you think about that? Uh, in, in a sense, we had no choice at the beginning. You know, to get momentum, we had to build a customer base, which meant we had to uh, do whatever it took to, to get those people in. Um, and we do challenge ourselves to go, you know, is, is there a better way? Um, and what we find over time is more and more people are just coming to naked off their own volition, not waiting for a voucher. Um, 
and yeah, the textbooks do would, would say that you know a strong promotional tactic like that is against your brand equity. But I think the reality is, if the core of your business is has an authentic idea at, at the centre of it, uh, that's the thing in the end that determines how people feel about your business, or whether they came in through a voucher or a recommendation or whatever becomes less relevant. Yeah. What was your biggest challenge retaining customers? Our biggest challenge with? Retaining, retention. Uh, delivery. So the thing that drives people hyperbolic is when delivery goes wrong and it's not in our hands. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, it is, it is the experience that makes or breaks the customer relationship. And if you think our average customer relationship is seven years, um, four uh, orders per customer per year is 28 orders. Uh, you, you only need a 3% failure rate for every single customer to have that experience. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we just had to be really on the ball with, we, first of all, finding a decent delivery partner and working closely with them for a good experience. Um, but also proactively tracking stuff so that if the delivery went wrong, we don't wait for the customer to phone us to go at my wireless and turn up. We track it every step of the way. And the second we know that uh, delivery made it to step 11, but not step 12 or 13 or 14, we don't wait for the customer to phone. We immediately reorder and start the next shipment and tell the customer, look, something's gone wrong with your delivery. We're not 100% sure what, but we've reordered. It is on its way. So by the time the customer confronts the fact that their wine isn't turning up when they thought it was going to, it's probably the next day and it's already done for them. Mm. Uh, and coincidentally, that also turns out to be cheaper. Because if you wait for a customer to tell you, they don't tell you once, they tell you about five times. Mm. And you know, one of those will be on Twitter, one will be on Facebook and all that kind of thing. So actually proactively telling customers, monitoring and telling sorting it out before they tell you to sort it out. Turns out to be good for your brand and good economics. Mm. And was that the, high, the the reason why most customers churned then? Was it was it delivery issues or? Yeah, I, you know, some. I think the second biggest reason is financial. So in January, you'll see a whole bunch of people. All the bills will turn up, and uh, and, and and you know, we'll see a lot of people cancel. But it's amazing how many of those people are back by April. Yeah. Uh, once the sort of shock of Christmas as well, and then. You know, one of the things we do is is when shit happens in people's lives, like uh, they, they get laid off or something like that, we try to be the one company that doesn't go, oh, you lost your job, bro, we're cutting you off. <laughs> um, and just, you know, treating people like that with respect. 90% uh, of people who lose their job have got another job within a few months and they remember the fact that we were, we were the company that treated them with dignity. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny how these things just come back to basic human empathy or, or, or you know, respect yeah. and it's hard, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and so many of these large companies or conglomerates, the big wine players, the, they just, it's hard to have that relationship with the customer in a way. Well, someone once said to me, the minute you start counting your customers and thinking about them with, in thousands or millions or whatever, instead of thinking about them as human beings, you tend to lose that humanity. Mm. And uh, I think it's very true. Yeah. And I mean, when you look at LTV and, and, and lifetime value and CAC gets thrown around the whole, all the time and, you know, people, people try and measure it down to the precise point two double digits or i mean how precise did you get with lifetime value how did you actually use it in practice um well you, you're right so lifetime value is an estimate uh, so there's no point trying to be over precise about it mm. uh, but what you definitely can do is you can say if if um we tried, you know, acquisition route A or acquisition route B. 
and measured in exactly the same way with presumably the same amount of error, A produces a 20% return better than B, uh, A is definitely the winner. <laughs> um, so, you know, if, if, if you try to be um, over scientific about it, you can trip yourself up. But if you're always comparing apples with apples and using it to tell you, to guide you, is the, the best way to take your business foot. It's a highly reliable tool. And, you know, Make has now been going 12 years. I've been out the business only a few months. But uh, one of the things that was very consistent, you can see it from our financial reporting, mm. is the evolution of every group of customers. It's amazing. Yeah. Consistent. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is one thing I think we, we mentioned before on our previous call is that a lot of, a lot of D to C companies just don't report like that. And, and, and that's like the biggest red flag you can find. Right. I mean, when you compare it to yeah. naked stuff, it's like they don't show you core cohort numbers or retention or yeah. payback. And it's like, what, <laughs> you know, how is that even yeah. possible? <laughs> a lot of companies don't even think like that. Well, this is, you know, this is the thing as well, right? Companies yeah. cutting marketing spend in a recession, for example. Yeah. You know, and going, oh, you know, we're going to try and manage our P&L as opposed to... Yeah. So how would you think right now then, if you know, let's say you're running naked, would you be looking to ramp up marketing? That's I mean, a signal quality they will. Uh, yeah, so I'm losing you a bit, you're, but I mean, you're cutting out yeah, every can, now and then. I can hear you. I can hear you back now. Um, so yeah, you mentioned during a recession, you would kind of ramp up the marketing then it seems. I'm struggling to hear you cutting out the whole time. Hello? Sorry. Try again. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned how like during a recession, for example, or like now, I mean, clearly it's, it's quite a good time for online businesses, you know, specifically naked. Um, but traditional companies typically cut marketing spend, which can't hear you. Hello, 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 hello. Hello. Can you hear Sorry, me? I hear you, Will. Sorry. All right. Can you hear me now? Cutting in and out. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, well, let's move on then. We can look at. Um, I mean, what does leadership mean to you, Ryan? What, is, what does leadership mean to you? Uh, you've gone again. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? I think I've lost you. Hello? Hello, hello. I think my side's on, it's him, isn't it? Hello. Hello. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 Hiya. Yes, I can hear you. But can you yep, hear me? Perfect. I can hear you too. Yep. Oh, great. Um, yes, I can't see you, but I can hear. I can hear you fine. I can. I can hear you now. See you now. Um. 
Okay. Um, where I missed what it was. Yeah, I think we can move it on. Be I mean, better to try this without video. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Let me just. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes, I can. Yes. I can hear you now and see you. <laughs> um, yeah, we can. I mean, let's we we can move on to look at the to talk about leadership. I mean, Ryan, what does leadership mean to you? <laughs> um, it's like what does breathing mean? It's a very hard question. So. Hmm. Um, maybe the best way to answer it is, you know, I started Naked Wines. Naked Wines was bought by Majestic. Um, so, if there are two contrasting experiences, one is you start a company, everyone's very much at the same level, um, and and the culture gets formed influenced very heavily by the fact it's a startup and you've all got to work hard together to make the thing work. And if you contrast that with Majestic, uh, it was a very hierarchical company. Um, and, um, you know, very few people had been there from the beginning. Um, and so one form of leadership at Naked was just effortless because I was just myself and I didn't need to think about it at all. And then when you went to, when I went to Majestic and all of a sudden I had to lead a thousand people um, and with a very different culture and also as, as a pretty inbuilt deep cynicism about the leadership. Mm. That was a real shock to the system because it never occurred to me that people would doubt my sincerity. So, you know, at Naked, I'd be used to saying if we were going to have some major change in direction, we would just get everyone together, open up a few packs of beer, uh, and say, right, guys, look, you know, we were doing this something in a particular way, and we think we should be doing it in a different way, and here are the reasons why, and practically from tomorrow, this is what this means, and here are difficulties that's going to cause for you and you know, appreciate your help in all pulling together to make this work. And the next day, everyone would take off at a 90 degree tangent. And, um, and there was a sort of inbuilt belief that if we were taking difficult decisions, that it was because we felt that was, because it was the right thing to do. The big surprise at Majestic was you would I would announce things that were <coughs> obviously patently in the interests of the employees. And at most, you'd get about 30% of people going along with it. Uh, so one of the things we implemented right at the beginning was the senior executives all used to get free shares. So I gave up my free shares to make them available so that every single member of staff would get free shares. And about 30% of people took up free shares. So he literally said to people, here's money for nothing. Here's free money. Mm. And about 30% of people go, okay, I'll take your free money. Thank you. And when I said to the other people, 
tell me, why aren't you taking the free money? What, what's going on? You would get kind of, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure what's involved. Mm. And, okay, it's free money. I don't know how much <laughs> you can make that. Um, so there is this very deep inbuilt cynicism about management's motives for doing things and a sort of belief that somewhere there was a catch and therefore if you could see a worm you needed to look for the hook because there would be one mm. and um and and you know so for the first time i had to stop and think about leadership in that sense and in a sense i think um the biggest mistake i made was uh in thinking I just need to stick to my principles and stick to my guns. And over time, people will come to see that I am sincere. And that if I say red is red and blue is blue, you know, I'm telling the truth. And I will win them round. Uh, and actually, in the end, I don't think it was true. I don't think I succeeded in doing that. And I think by the time I left, probably the sort of degree of buying to management teams actions was no higher than it was at the beginning uh, and that's after a lot of hard work and a lot of changes we thought were positive and um, significantly improving the, the the lot of the um, the people who worked there but it was it was still a very difficult thing to do and I think what they're talking about leadership is sometimes you have to change the people so you know sometimes just doing your job isn't good enough and uh, you can only be a leader if people want to follow you. It, it isn't a, you, you can't force people to follow you. Mm. And, you know, when they've, when they've psychologists have, have uh, tried to understand what would make apparently sane people jump up from behind a trench and run into an enemy machine gun, it's not the promise of the medal. It's not the promise of being jailed if you don't. It is the fact that if you don't do that, someone else is going to have to do it. It is fellowship with your your comrades. And if a company doesn't have that, it's almost impossible to lead them. So I think the way I think about leadership is you, you, you're not appointed a leader. You earn leadership. And you can only earn leadership from the right people. Hmm. And in terms of building that from the start, you mentioned how a couple of things with naked where you all had equity. So that created yep. a culture of, you know, we're all aligned. Is there anything else that you designed from the beginning to make sure that you could naturally be the leader to, be, to begin with? Yeah, there had to be an element of, um, we're in this together and this isn't different people are going to get different rewards out of it, but you know, everybody is going to be treated fairly. Uh, and part of that is you, you've just got to work bloody hard and, and people have got to see that you're in it together. Part of it is, you know, when it comes to Christmas and the shit is the fan and the call center or the warehouse or something, the management team roll their sleeves up and come and join the call center or go and pick wine in the warehouse. Mm. And are not just sitting and twiddling their thumbs and saying, you guys aren't doing a good enough job. Uh, we used to have a thing where if there was a very difficult customer on the phone, anybody could just send the customer to me. And so we always, we wanted people on the front line to know we were never asking them to do something that we weren't prepared to do as well. And then the final piece was the, uh, the testing culture where there were a bunch of really good ideas that were implemented that came directly out of customer facing roles like the call center. And, um, and, and, and that was because, A, we systematically collected those ideas and got opinions from other people, in, from their colleagues, to go, which of these ideas do people really believe in? But then we tested a lot of them. And so, you know, if we were implementing something that wasn't uh, just something done at face value to go, oh, aren't we a lovely, inclusive employer? It was because we'd tested it and measured that it actually worked and so we were implementing it sincerely so i think that you know when people can see that the route to the top is a meritocracy 
that their ideas are taken seriously, their concerns are taken seriously, and the people at the top are prepared to muck in and help when things get tough. Mm. That you just, you know, you don't need to do much more than that, and you particularly don't need value statements or visions or purposes or any of the, which we never managed to really nail successfully, any of that, that, that kind of stuff. But it was more just a case of we are in this together. Right. And um, what about how you think about entrepreneurship and what you've learned about bringing I would arguably two different businesses or products to, to market, both in Virgin and in Naked. What what does entrepreneurship that word mean to you? It gets it gets bound around a lot, but again, it's it, another fuzzy it word. <laughs> it does. I, I I think the core of it is resilience, and uh, I think the, the the thing which distinguishes a lot of entrepreneurs from people who are cleverer and harder working and had better ideas but didn't succeed is they just never bloody give up <laughs> and when everyone else thinks it's hopeless they're still plugging away at it and um you know every time i hear about some startup that's pivoting i groan slightly because i see so many people who start with a really brilliant idea and when they confront the inevitable problems they go oh we're going to pivot and we're going to give up on our original idea we're going to go and try some other idea and the only difference between those ideas is they can't see the problems with the second idea yet, but they will. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I've done four startups. <coughs> Three out of the four have succeeded. Um, sorry, I've done five. Four out of five have succeeded. Um, but the common theme in all of them was after the initial rush of doing the startup, came a really hard difficult period where things were tough suppliers were doubting you the bank was calling up saying they want to call the overdraft you know star employees were starting to dust off their resumes thinking Mm. oh this is going to fail Uh, and it looked like all was lost and i think resilience is the thing that gets people through that Mm. what was the moment in in your background where you faced the most adversity or the biggest challenge where you had to be resilient um so when we i set up virgin money then when i say i set up with the team right virgin money then a bank called the virgin one account then we did virgin wines and you know the, the thought was what could possibly go wrong you know it's the internet, it's virgin, it's wine, it's all those sexy ideas all combined into one. And we raised 20 million pounds in 1999, when 20 million pounds was still a lot of money. Mm. Uh, and we blew it all, copying all the other dot-com startups with fancy advertising campaigns and glamorous head offices and gigantic mm. IT teams and all the rest of it. And it just completely flopped. And at first, I couldn't... I, I didn't have the humility to go, I've got this wrong. I kept thinking, no, no, I'm a successful entrepreneur. So the problem isn't me or my idea. The problem's something else. And I had to take a sort of big dose of humble pie to go, actually, maybe I do have this wrong. And uh, we literally ran out of money. And one of my colleagues is a guy called Luke Jets, who landed up setting up our Australian business for Naked. Uh, Luke was the one who eventually said, look, if we look through the customers, uh, most of the customers come and go pretty quickly, but there is this small group of customers who are really resilient and stick around and are very valuable. And what makes those customers different is they're not buying big brands, they're buying small wines, uh, wines from small wineries, and they are subscription type customers. And... If we just had those people, we'd have a great business. We just reconfigure our whole business around acquiring those people instead of configuring it around selling wine. And that's what we did. And we risked it. But to do that, we had to get rid of 80% of the people, uh, go from you know fancy head office in London to much more humble headquarters in Norwich. Mm. And we had to bootstrap it. Um, and that was very tough, losing a lot of good people and good friends amongst them. 
but it was also a very valuable learning experience. And um, you know, in, in the end, that was that business thing became what is Virgin Wines today. And a lot of the thinking that went into make was formed through that experience as well. But it was that was a very tough time. And it was a classic time. That would have been a very easy time to give up. <laughs> mm. um, but you know, I, I did believe in in the core of it. So that's what kept us going. What do you think? I mean, when you look at entrepreneurs or or, or yourself and, and the character, what is it about resilience, or what makes someone resilient in an idea, but also just in, in, in character? Uh, I think you know. So resilient people. What 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 is behind that resilience? I think they tend to be independently minded. You know, entrepreneurs are famously difficult, and so they're prepared to keep proceeding with the course of action when everyone around them is going, no, this is wrong. Secondly, the good ones base that on data, not on a hunch. And so, at, you know, in like an example I've just given, we didn't keep virgin wines going in the face of all the evidence to the contrary without someone pointing out that when you look below the surface, there was a kernel of great customers. And... Um, you know, there was hard data to say that our original belief had been world famous. Um, and then I think it's, it's it kind of reserves of, it, it's just the ability to, when everyone else has given up to keep going. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, I can't really describe it in any other way, but you, you do see like a, you know, Johnny Wilkinson, Famously, when when asked why he's such a good goal kicker, it's just like I, I stayed after everyone else went home and yeah. kept practicing. And there's a lot of truth to that. 